G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. Now most people tend to think that PAOs represent the pinnacle of base oils. And I'm here to tell you that I just don't think that that's the case. PAOs are great and they're perfect for some applications, but my personal favorite out of all the synthetic base oils is alkylated naphthalene. Now it's my job to convince you why. Let's talk about alkylated naphthalenes the undisputed king of base oils. Well, maybe disputed, but it's my personal favorite. So in our traditional picture of the API groups, it's very much a pyramid where paraffinic products are at the top. And if you think of the refining process, as we move from group one to group two, to group three, to group four, the process is really one in which we remove arith aromatic and naphthenic compounds in the view of trying to get more paraffinic or more isoparaffinic and PAO represents the top of the tree. Now I think that that is a perhaps a too simplistic model and I think that every type of lubricant has its place in specific applications. So let's talk a little bit about aromatics because they're kind of the poor cousins to the naphthenic and paraffinic crudes. So what's so bad about aromatics? Well, in order to really talk about that, we need to talk about cyclic compounds in general. So if we go back to carbon, we know that carbon can form four different bonds, right? And it's usually represented as this kind of tetrahedral arrangement. It can therefore form stable rings of six carbons in which each of these different carbons has two different hydrogens that are attached to it. Now, I'm not going to go, you can just imagine that uh, each of these carbons has two hydrogens attached. And this here, we would call a you know, cycloalkane. In this case, it's cyclohexane, because of course there's six carbons. We generally represent it without any of the carbons and hydrogens, and we just show this, this hexagon. Now, aromatics are ones in which the carbons are both double bonded to an adjoining carbon. And so that means that each carbon is then attached to a single hydrogen, right, in the, in the base case. Now, the way that we represent this is a little bit incomplete. We like to think of bonds as being between one atom and another atom. But in this instance, we have an, uh, a case where the pi bonds uh, which are the second of the double bonds, it, it's not really a one-to-one -one relationship. And in fact, what they're doing is they're fluctuating between states. It's actually better to imagine that the shared electron kind of sits in a donut above the hexagon. It's a bit of a weird picture to get your head around. But because of that, we usually represent these with a circle in the middle and we call these aromatic compounds. Now, the fact that the pi bond is in this weird state where it's shared between all the different carbons makes it actually quite stable and more stable than you would expect considering that double bonds are traditionally much weaker than single bonds. Now that structure also gives us clues as to why aromatics have traditionally had a bit of a bad name. Probably the most famous aromatic is, is benzene and it of course has unfortunately carcinogenic properties which is to say that it will over time give you cancer and aromatics have got uh, a bit of a reputation for being toxic. Now the reason why this is the case is if you look at the components of uh, DNA, so there is uh, A, C, T and G, I'm having to reach back into year 10 biology here, you can see from T and C, thymine and cytosine, that they look very much like aromatic compounds and the fact that uh, aromatic hydrocarbons look like these, uh, I'm not going to get the biology exactly correct here, but because they're water insoluble, they can make their way, basically enforce their way into your DNA and, and disrupt the uh, replication process. Of course, when you disrupt replication, that can lead to mutations and mutations can ultimately lead to, to harmful cancers. And so that's why these uh, compounds tend to get a, a bit of a bad reputation. Now, how can we fix that? Well, first, the first step is to um, put a couple of these compounds together. So naphthalene 
might be something that you're familiar with, and that's effectively just two benzene rings put together. Now, that's actually the primary component in mothballs. Most people would have mothballs at some somewhere in their house or have had exposure to them as a, as a kid or something like that, and they're relatively harmless as long as you don't go around eating them. Now, what we do to make an alkylated naphthalene is that we take the naphthalene molecule and we react it with an olefin. So you'll remember the word olefin from polyalpha olefin. So olefin just basically means a straight carbon chain that has a double bond in it. And when we react these two together, we get an alkylated naphthalene. This is the most basic form where we've just reacted it with a single uh, olefin and it undergoes a substitution reaction. So uh, again, getting into the chemistry a little bit, aromatic compounds tend to resist uh, addition reactions because the double bonds are relatively stable. And so generally what happens is that you pull off one of the hydrogens and you replace it with the uh, olefin chain. So this is what an alkylated naphthalene is. Now, I'm just going to represent this with a little R that's coming off to say that that's the olefin, and you get really, really good oxidative stability. In fact, better oxida oxidative stability than a lot of esters. Probably doesn't err quite on the side of a PAO, but very, very good thermo-oxidative stability properties. And the cool with al thing with alkylated naphthalene is you get probably a little bit more customization than you would get out of the PAO platform, but not quite as much as the ester platform. And that's because we can vary a few things here. There's a, there's a few variables. We can change, for example, the size of the olefin chain. So we, we can react it with a C12, C15, C16, C18. And depending on the size of the chain, we can alter things like the flow properties. We can also um, determine what kind of branches. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an olefin, although they are the most common alkylated naphthalenes. You can react it with something else to give you different properties. And finally, the number of chains. So here I've shown you know, up to four different um, alkyl groups coming off the naphthalene rings. And so by altering the number of uh, olefin sites, we can also change the properties of alkylated naphthalene as well. One thing that is really good about alkylated naphthalenes is the aniline point. So aniline point is a bit of a proxy for, if you like, uh, the polarity of the molecule, but also the solvency of the, of the molecule. So esters really sit on one end, and the group 1s to 4s, particularly PAOs, sit at the other extreme, where they're very, very nonpolar. Now, why do you want something that has some polarity to it? Well, you want some polarity because it helps with additive solvency. So a lot of additives have a polar component to them, and they kind of resist being solvated inside something like a PAO uh, because PAOs are so nonpolar. And that's why generally with uh, you know PAO formulations, and particularly metallocene PAO formulations, you'll often need a cobase. So it'll contain a little bit of ester just to suspend, well not suspend, sorry, solvate the, the additive pack. Now, alkylated naphthalene represents a really good compromise. It sits kind of in the middle of the esters and the traditional mineral oils. And what you'll find is you get a little bit of difference whether it's a monoalkylated naphthalene, so 1R group, or a polyalkylated alkylated naphthalene. So you get better additive solvency than a PAO, and you also get less additive interference than you would from an ester. Now, what do I mean by additive interference? Well, that's a good question. So you can imagine that... Um, you know, this gray line that I'm showing on the bottom here, let's say that, that represents a metal surface that you are trying to protect. Well, we know that charge sits on the surface of metals, and that's what we use that property to get uh, additives to interact with metal surfaces. So most, you know, uh, anti-wear additives, for example, are polar because we want them to be drawn to the metal surface. The thing is that base oil molecules, if they are polar, are also drawn to interact with the metal surface. The more polar it is, the more likely it is to interact. So here, you know, where I'm showing a diester, because the oxygen groups are uh, highly polar in comparison to a PAO or an alkylated naphthalene, they want to interact with the metal surface even more. Now, why could that be a bad thing? Well, imagine I'm going to show an alkylated naphthalene uh, molecule with one box and an ester with another box. And you can imagine that in a fully formulated lubricant, you have a mix of base oil molecules and additive molecules. So add in red is an additive molecule. Now, if you have a, a charged surface, 
right? It's going to attract different molecules. Well, esters are polar enough that they can sometimes actually crowd out the additives, right? So that can reduce the potency of some additives in formulations, whereas alkylated naphthalenes tend to do that less. So they are able to hold additives in solution, but they don't tend to compete with them on metal surfaces. So in, in a lot of instances, the, the uh, action of additives is actually improved by switching from an ester to an alkylated naphthalene cobase. What other cool properties do you get out of it? Well, you get better hydrolytic stability than esters. You know, in the hydrolytic stability video I did a couple of weeks ago, you could see that it was really the oxygen that was under attack. And we don't really have those functional groups on an alkylated naphthalene, so it doesn't tend to suffer from hydrolytic instability. We also get comparable seal swell to esters. So um, the reason I raise this is because PAOs are known to generally shrink seals. And so the esters in most PAO formulations help to balance that out because esters swell seals. So in alkylated naphthalenes, we get a little bit of seal, seal swell. It also tends to have better lubricity than a PAO and better oxidative stability than an ester. So again, it's this kind of jack of all trades that kind of has properties that sit between a, a PAO and an ester. Now, where would you use it? Because it's very rare to see alkylated naphthalene uh, lubricants out in the wild. Well, the first way that you can use it is simply as a base oil. So I've seen a couple of gear oils that are predominantly alkylated naphthalene based, and they have extremely good pro performance properties. They tend to be on the expensive side, but they are extremely good. Um, very good in very high temperature applic applications. So in things like kiln uh, gearboxes, for example, uh, very, very good performance and extremely long life. You, it also tends to resist uh, varnish because it has, um, especially when it's used as, a, as the primary base oil, alkylated naphthalene has that extra solvency. So when there are oxidation byproducts, it tends to hold them in solution much better. The most common way that it's used though is as a co-base. So there are a handful of engine oils out there that I've seen, can't name them off the top of my head, um, where they swapped out the ester co-base for an alkylated naphthalene one. And again, you get really good properties out of it because as I explained before, sometimes the anti-wear pack is able to be more effective um, at, at the same treat rate. Finally, it can be used also as an additive. So I've seen this a lot in the turbine oil market where um, you know varnish is something that plagues turbines at the moment. And the, the reality is the reason that those varnish problems exist is because the group three turbine oils, which are reasonably common now, or group two and group three plus PAO, they're very, very low solvency. And so when you get uh, varnish precursors and oxidative uh, decomposition products, they tend to fall out of solution very quickly. So putting in alkylated naphthalene is a really good kind of uh, top treat solution to increase the solvency of the overall turbine oil. Now, what's interesting about that is there's sort of uh, two main companies that produce alkylated naphthalene. ExxonMobil Chemicals makes them in two grades. There's an AN5 and an AN12. And then King Industries makes a whole bunch. So King Industries is really interesting because I believe that alkylated naphthalene was actually um, an intermediate product that was used for some other process until they discovered that there was actually a market for them in lubricants. And King Industries, I think, makes something like nine uh, different viscosity grades of alkylated naphthalene. Now, the one that's interesting for the turbine oil market is AN5 because at 40 degrees cent, uh, Celsius, uh, the, um, the viscosity of that product, I think, is at about a 28. And most turbine oils are a, a 32 weight. So it's, it's almost a, an exact match. And so you can pretty much pour it straight into the turbine oil at a relatively low treat rate, and it will help um, suspend that varnish for a little bit longer. So anyway, this has been uh, alkylated naphthalene. I think that it is wildly underused in the industry, and I think there's so many cool uh, uses and applications of this product, and I really hope to see it more in future formulations. So as usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.